Welcome back to session three of Statistical Thinking for Forensic Practitioners, a fall 2022 CSAFE short course sponsored by NIST. Your speaker again, the one and only Hal Stern, the provost and executive vice chancellor and chancellor's professor in the Department of Statistics at the University of California, Irvine, also a co-director at CSAFE. Hal, thanks for joining us and please take it away. Thank you, Anthony. Thanks for the introduction and welcome everyone. Uh, so this is, as Anthony says, week three of uh, statistical thinking for forensic practitioners. Uh, I have reworked the course this year, so we have four sessions. Uh, the final session is next Friday at uh, 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern, and other times as appropriate. Uh, as a reminder of where we've been and where we're going, uh, this lays out the four sessions and I'll do a little bit of review, but today's session focuses on statistical inference and then the second half on what is commonly called the two-stage approach to assessing forensic evidence. Um, and next week, the final session will focus on the likelihood ratio. I thought it'd be good to do a little bit of a Zoom poll uh, reminder about how to do Zoom polls and collect some uh, demographic information about people who are here. So uh, there are multiple questions on this Zoom poll, uh, where you are, what disciplines you practice, whoops, sorry, background moving. Um, and then uh, last two questions ask whether you attend a session one or session two or both. So take a little bit of time and answer those, that would be wonderful. And so as uh, usually the case spread out across the US, we have in the past had a few from Europe uh, or South America, but not today. Uh, although they may be the people who are in somewhere more exciting. Um, and then uh, as the CSAFE is a physics pattern specialization unit, so uh, that's good, chemistry and seize drugs uh, and biology, which is interesting more than usual. Um, great to see that uh, almost everybody who participated um, uh, has either saw this session live for week one and two or watched the recording. Um, if somewhat interestingly, the, oh, they're listed as multiple choice. I couldn't quite figure out how the third one, the last question added up to 104%, but now I know. Okay, thanks everyone, appreciate that. Appreciate the participation, I'm having a little control issue here. All right, so let's get started in this week's session. Uh, the goals for today, I like to lay these out up front. Um, so, the beginning of the presentation today is a real uh, review of what you would have seen in a statistics course maybe years ago, um, and that's focused on uh, the basic idea about learning about a population, uh, point estimation, interval estimation, and hypothesis testing, and then the final objective really brings us back to forensics. Um, I will say um, I've been enjoying the course this year in part because I was able to having four sessions spread out the forensics and the statistics so it there's no session just on statistics and no session just on forensics okay uh, a reminder of the big picture with which I start each session um, what the way that statistics works is we think always about a population that we're trying to learn about and a sample that we have and probability which we covered a couple of weeks ago talks about how knowledge from about the population can be used to make predictions or tell you what you're likely to see in a sample. And today we'll see that statistics is about the tools that we use to take data we may get from a sample and learn about the population. Here's a recap. Um, it's impossible to recap an hour in a minute, but uh, these are the key points that I hope people remember about probability. Uh, so I would, Probability is just a way of assigning numbers to chances. Um, conditional probability turns out to be really, really important. And what conditional probability means is we say, what's the probability that some event will happen given some other set of information? And I draw your attention to the last bullet on this slide, which says, uh, which is a reminder about how we read conditional probability statements that when we write, as I have here, the probability of A given B, it says, what is the, what, what 
we are assigning probabilities to the event A. That is, we are telling you how likely A is to happen. And B is the information we're assuming to be true. And so if you track that, it means that the probability of A given B is different than the probability of B given A. And when we talked about probability, we saw a few examples of that. The second session focused on the data collection, measurement, reliability, validity, and so a few reminders of the key points there, um, especially points that are relevant for today. Uh, random samples allow us to generalize from the sample to the population. I gave several examples of political polls where poorly chosen samples led to the wrong answer. And we also talked about how data gets collected for studies or experiments and learn that controlled experiments where the person doing the experiment knows the uh, assigns treatments to individuals uh, allows us to draw cause and effect conclusions. And then the forensic focus last week was on black box studies. And we talked about how black box studies can allow us at a discipline level, not the individual examiner, but for the discipline, tell us about reliability or consistency of judgments and validity or accuracy of judgments. One of the things we mentioned in talking about data, and this will be relevant for the first part of today's session, is that there are different types of data. And this is important because there are also different types. These different types of data correspond to different types of evidence or the other way around. Different types of evidence will make use of different kinds of data. So you have categorical data, ordinal data, which is also categorical, but has an order in, ordering to it, like the grades in a class. And then we have quantitative data, which is numerical measurements of some kind, which can be discrete, meaning have a small number of values, like the number of consecutive matching stria, or it can be continuous, such as the refractive index of a glass measurement, where we'll see that measurements can be 1.5192, 1.5193. Uh, you can get as many different answers as you want by recording more and more decimal places. To motivate uh, moving the conversation to statistics, uh, I've tried to motivate everything we do by some reference to the, statistics, to the forensics world to start. Uh, and then we'll visit the statistics and then we'll come back to the forensic world. So I remind you or draw your attention to this ASTM standard, which is for using high tech uh, to measure chemical element concentrations in glass. And the boldface phrase says the use of an elemental analysis method yields high discrimination among sources of glass. So we have the notion from the standard that if we measure glass, we might be able to draw some conclusions about the source of the glass and to distinguish two sources of glass. And that turns out, although it's not obvious there, uh, to be a statistics question. Uh, uh, we can fit this into the big picture. We will fit this into the big picture by thinking about having two glass samples and two glass populations. So the two glass samples are pretty straightforward. One is the glass found at the crime scene, broken window maybe, and the other is glass found on a suspect, maybe on their sweatshirt or sweater. Right? And the population is more conceptual in this case. We think of this glass fragments at the crime scene as coming from one source of glass, one population of glass, and we think about the fragments, fragments on the sweater as coming from a second population of glass. And then the question we really have in mind is, are these the same population or are they two distinguishable populations? Uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but it is in the standard. Section 11 tells how you might go about determining whether two sets of glass samples are indistinguishable or not. Um, and if you kind of read through it quickly, I won't. Um, you'll see some terms that we saw last week, like the standard deviation and the mean and the minimum. And, and you see a prescription for how one should proceed, compute the mean, add four standard deviations, um, and then compare the two samples. This is a statistical inference procedure. Um, and so we'll come back to that as we learn more explicitly what a statistical inference procedure is. But you can see that statistics clearly germane to forensics. It is part and parcel of this standard. So as we think about moving from 
probability, which is what we talked about the first week in the class two statistics that we're going to talk about today, the key intermediary is really the data. So if we have a, a categorical variable like blood type, we summarize data with a table. And so this table, which we'll see a few times uh, today and later in the course, is uh, the frequency within the US population that individuals have these different blood types. And so you can see that blood type A is, pop, is prevalent, 42% of the population. AB is rare. Uh, discrete data, similar. We can create a table. This from a thesis that was done in Oklahoma. I lost some of the background for this, but a student at one of the universities in Oklahoma did a study where they took uh, two bullet groove impressions for bullets fired from the same gun and did an analysis, computed the number of consecutive matching stria. They did that for 146 pairs. These are all matching pairs to get an idea about the distribution of matching stria. And so here you can see both the count and the frequency. And because these are numbered, you could also compute a mean and a standard deviation. So the mean number of consecutive matching stria is three and the standard deviation is one. And then later in the course, we'll see quite a bit of data about glass. Um, so this is an example of refractive index measures from glass. We can summer, summarize it with uh, a picture like this. This is known as a histogram. Um, and it shows you which measurements are more frequent. And so you can see that there are uh, 49 uh, fragments here. Um, and the refractive index for each fragment is shown. And the picture shows you that most of the measurements are right around 1.52, a little lower, a little higher. Um, I also provide some numerical summaries. Again, the mean and the standard deviation. In this case, the standard deviation is very, very small, if you notice the axis here. Um, and I've also provided the smallest measurement, the 25th percentile, the middle or median measurement, uh, 75th percentile on the maximum. So this is how we think about data. One thing that will play a role in uh, our statistical procedures and in the likelihood ratio next week is the idea of a probability distribution. And so I go back for a second. This is what I would call uh, an empirical distribution. Someone actually broke glass, measured it, uh, and recorded the data. So these are real measurements from data. Probability distributions are, if you will, theoretical or conceptual models, mathematical models for what data might look like. And so I've listed four common distributions here, and I have pictures of them on the next slide um, just to show you. So a binomial distribution counts the number of successes. So I might have uh, a suitcase with 10 bags of white powder and want to know what proportion of them are containing illicit substances. Um, the binomial distribution might be used to characterize this. And I've shown the distribution here for a binomial with 0.75. So if 75% of the population is illicit substances, and I take a sample of 10 bags, I will probably get seven or eight bags that have drugs in them. But I could get all 10 by chance, right? So this shows what could happen by chance. Uh, Poisson is a count for a number of events often. The normal distribution is the most popular uh, in the world, and I'll tell why a little later. This is a distribution that people sometimes use to describe IQ scores. Um, and chemical measurements, we had some chem people who do analysis of uh, toxicology here today. Uh, concentrations of chemical ele elements often have distributions like this, uh, parts per million, uh, a lot of very small measurements, but occasionally large measurements. So probability distributions, these are not actual data. These are models for data, and they turn out to be useful tools as we go forward. I've repeated here the big picture um, to tell you I, the, the only thing that's added here is the bullet at the bottom of the slide, which is how are we going to do statistical inference? We're going to take some of the pieces that I described to this point. Uh, we're going to build a, or a model for the population. So I'm going to say, let's suppose the population is normal and has a mean of 100. And then I'm going to collect a sample. And then I'll look at this sample. And I'm going to look at the sample and use some statistical techniques to say, 
is this sample consistent with what I thought the population would look like? And if the answer is no, I'll probably go back and try and fix the model so that it better explains the sample. And that's how statisticians operate. They're often looking at data, a sample, trying to understand a population, and they do it through this iterative process. So let's see how that might work. To see how it might work, I'm going to introduce not a lot, but a few terms that are more statistical in nature. The first is a parameter. So a parameter is a numerical summary of the population. The most common probably is a population mean. Examples I often give are, if I thought of, I, I worked at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, there's 37,000 students at the University of California, Irvine. A population parameter might be, what's the mean height of 37,000 students at UC Irvine? That's, there's an answer to that question. I could measure all 37,000 people and compute the average. So, there, so there's a true population mean height. Right, that's the parameter. Uh, the other example I've listed is if you're a shoe print examiner, you might want to know what's the proportion of size nine shoes in the United States. Again, conceptually, we could get that. We would just collect every single shoe in the United States, and measure them all, and record the proportions. So, of course, the reason we don't know the answers to these questions is that's a lot of work. Right? So we don't want to collect all the shoes. So statistics arises as a field, as a discipline, because we want to learn something about a population, and we don't want to study every single unit in the population. So we'll take a sample, a small number of the students at UC Irvine, a small number of shoes in the United States, and look at that sample. And so I've listed here two key concepts. Um, there only used to be one, but as I reworked the material, the first is understanding the difference between the population and the sample, which I've emphasized. And the second is because the population and sample are different, then clearly the mean of the sample and the mean of the population are different. So knowing the mean of 37,000 UC Irvine students height is different than me taking the 20 students in my class, computing their heights and recording their average. And the power of statistics is we can use the laws of probability that we learned a little bit about in the first session to say, oh, I took these 20 students. If it's a good sample, we'll say more about that, then their average height should be a good guess for the population average height. And the laws of probability will tell us how good, how close can I expect that sample average to be to the population average. So when we do that, and I've given a couple more examples of parameters here, it turns out there are three kinds of statements we make. One is called a point estimate. I look at my sample and I say, based on my sample, I estimate that 21% of shoes in the United States are size nine. That seems a little high. Maybe it's more like 11% are size nine. Okay. Uh, that's can be helpful information. Uh, I'll argue as we cover the material that a point estimate by itself is not super helpful. Uh, we should also, excuse me, provide a measure of uncertainty with that. That was one of the points we made last week for those who were here. Um, so that leads us to think about an interval estimate, uh, uh, being able to make a statement that says, I'm very confident based on the data I've seen that the proportion of shoes in the population that are size nine is between eight and 14, maybe, right? So that's another kind of statement we might make. And the third kind of statement we might make is we might have a hypothesis that 10% uh, of the shoes are size nine, and we might want to assess whether that's true or not. Uh, that specific example is probably not very compelling, uh, but you can imagine wanting to test a hypothesis about whether two sets of glass fragments have the same uh, aluminum concentration, because that would provide evidence that they may have come from the same source. So those are the kinds of statements we want to make. We'll start with the first of those, a point estimate. So a uh, new term, again, for the day, uh, an estimator is a rule for estimating a population parameter from a sample. We evaluate estimators by thinking about how they would do if I took a lot of samples. And so uh, 
you know, I'll stay with these two examples that I've mentioned, the shoe sizes and the individuals. Um, though the in heights of individuals is not terribly forensic. It's just a nice example that we can all understand and think about how we might work. And so the notion of uh, I'm going to take a sample from the population and I'm going to measure them and I'm going to record their average height and I'm going to use that as my estimator. Well, if I'm taking 20 students and I'm in a population of 37,000, there are lots of possible samples. So I could take 20, record their average height, and then throw those 20 back into the pool, pick a new set of 20, measure their heights, record their average height. Right? And so I could do that lots and lots of times and get different estimates from the sample. We would never do that in practice, but to understand how this estimator works, I can think conceptually about doing that. And two quantities that come up are bias. We all know what bias means in our day-to-day -day conversation. Someone has a bias or a prejudice um, you know, in a negative way. It could be a bias uh, against a particular uh, kind of, uh, of group or person. So we don't like that. Um, but a bias can also just mean a tendency. And in this case, uh, statistical bias refers to whether the estimator comes close to the true population value or not. The second quantity that we tend to look at a lot is variability. Indeed, we talked about variability last week a great deal. Uh, variability gives us an idea about how much things will change from sample to sample. And so bias and variability are two key quantities. And so I'm going to show you a little bit more about bias and variability. But to do that, I want to go back to this standing example of trying to estimate the average height in our population. And I'm going to tell you three estimators that I could use. One estimator is the mean. So take a sample from the population, record the mean. And I have in parentheses here the spoiler alert. So if you don't like spoilers, stop paying attention. Uh, the sample mean is a very good estimate. Uh, another estimator that people can use in this setting is the median of the random sample. Why might you use the median, the middle value in their sample, rather than the average? Well, I give an example here. Suppose I had a sample of nine uh, measurements, and they were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ninety. Um, the average of those nine numbers is 14, and the median is five. They're very different, even though they're both supposed to be measuring the center of the distribution. Why are they different? The mean is affected by that big value. You can't tell from here whether the 90 is accurate, in which case 14 is a great estimate, um, or the 90 is a typo, and it was supposed to be nine, in which case five would be the better estimate. So the third one here is a little odd, but it strikes my sense of humor, um, right? Another way to estimate is I could say, I'm going to use 47 as my estimator. No matter what question you ask me, what proportion of shoes are size 9? 47. What's the average height of UCI undergraduates? 47. What was the mean on the test I gave my students? 47, right? I can use that as an estimator. An estimator is a rule for estimating a population parameter from a sample. In this case, I'm ignoring the sample and estimating 47. So that seems like a terrible thing to do, of course, unless the population mean happens to be 47, in which case I got it exactly right, right? So those are the three estimators with very different uh, properties. This is a conceptual picture that we sometimes use. So there's not a real estimation problem. It's a conceptual picture to show you what we mean by bias and variability. So, and it comes from thinking about shooting or uh, you know, doing archery and aiming at this target. The center of the target here is the Greek letter theta. Uh, which statisticians sometimes use to represent the true but unknown population mean, for example. And the dots represent estimates that we might get from different samples. And so the first picture here, the top left, shows you that in repeated samples, I'm, I generally get very close to theta. So here is a situation we would call low bias, I'm near theta. And low variance, it's very compact set of points. They're almost all in the inner circle. We can contrast that with the bottom right. The bottom right has two problems associated with it. One, 
the answer, the estimates are all far from the truth, high bias, and they're also pretty spread out amongst themselves, high variance. And so the other two show two different combinations. Um, none of these, uh, all of these are okay. They're just examples of what can happen when we try to estimate a parameter. My notion of using 47 is a little bit like this picture at the bottom left, right? Um, I always get the same answer. I get a low variance, but I'm not close to the truth in this case. So that's how we think about estimation and how we describe how estimators perform. But point estimators have a problem. The point, the yeah, problem is they don't provide any indication of uncertainty. Uh, you give people an answer, I believe 11% of shoes are size nine, but you don't give them any statement about how sure you are. And we argued last time that that's important. The ISO standard 17025 says whenever you give a measurement, and I would say whenever you give an estimate, you should provide a measure of uncertainty with that. And so let's talk about how we might provide that information. Uh, this is a place where the terminology can be a little confusing, so that's a warning. Um, I start with this uh, bullet that says review here. Uh, last time we talked about when we collect data, we can usually use the mean or the median as a summary of what the center of the distribution is. And then we can use the standard deviation, sometimes abbreviated SD, as a measure of the spread or variability in the sample. So the standard deviation I think about as a measure of uncertainty, and it speaks to the single measurement. When we look at a summary statistic, like a mean or a median, it too is a random quantity. And so when we take random different sample, when you take a different sample from the population, you get different measurements. When you take different samples, you get different means. And so the standard error is the term that we use to describe the variability of an estimator. I'm about to say something that is uh, without, without doubt very confusing. A standard error is, in fact, a standard deviation. Uh, if you find that troubling, please ignore it. Um, but what happens is the standard deviation, the way of measuring variability, I can apply that idea to a single measurement. What is the standard deviation of heights on campus? And I can apply it to my the mean from my 20 students. And I can say, if I kept taking means of 20 students, how much variability would I see there? Those are both standard deviations, but to separate them, I use standard error for the second one. And I say, when I'm talking about an estimator, I collected a sample, I computed a sample mean. When I'm talking about an estimator, I'll use the standard error as the term to describe how much variability there is, how much that jumps around from sample to sample. So let's see how that might work. Here's a distribution of IQ scores. Um, this is what I would call a theoretical distribution of IQ scores, um, but it is it accurately describes IQs in the population. Not uh, so that's what this distribution is. Um, this distribution has mean 100. This shouldn't surprise you. The center is 100, and it looks pretty symmetric. So the average is 100. And the standard deviation is 15. Um, and because this is a normal distribution, I actually know some things about it. I know that 68% of the observations are within one standard deviation of the center. And so 68% of the observations from an IQ test would range between 85 and 115, and 95% would range between 70 and 130. So that's how we can use the standard deviation to talk about individual observations. But we're not interested in individual observations. We're interested in samples. So I'm going to do a study of IQs, and I want to take a sample of 25 people. I give them an IQ test, and we get the values that are indicated here. Uh, I put them in order from lowest to highest, 63, 
87, 88, 89, dot, 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 142. And if I'm looking at this sample, and it's a random sample, so it represents the population. I find that the sample mean was 104.1, and the sample standard deviation is 16.4. Notice that these are close to the population mean and the population standard deviation, but they're not exactly the same. We know that's going to happen because it's a random sample. To get the population mean, I'd have to get all the people in the world and give them an IQ test. I can't do that. I can use the sample of 25, and it comes out pretty close to that population mean. And now let's take another sample. When you take another sample, again, no surprise, the numbers come out different. This time I got the lowest score was a 65. This time the highest score was only 122. The mean here was 96.2 and the standard deviation was 15.2. Uh, the mean is again close to the population mean. The standard deviation is actually very close to the population standard deviation, but two points, one, they differ from the population mean and the population standard deviation. And second point, they differ from the first sample. So the sample mean and the sample standard deviation differ every time I take a different sample. And so I don't, I should have, but I don't have our big picture here. This is the big picture. This is what it's all about for statistics. You have a population you wanna learn about, you take a sample, you get a summary from the sample, it's similar to, but not identical, the summaries of the population. So we just saw that two random samples give two different sample means. The standard error summarizes how different those sample means can be. I showed you two different sample means. One was 96, one was 104. What would happen if I took more samples? how variable would they be? Is that typical? Was the 96 and the 104 unusual? It turns out the standard error is the quantity we use to, to answer that question. And the standard error is related to the standard deviation in the population that I started with. So remember, and it's de determined by how big a sample I take. We know this should be true, why do we know this? Because uh, let's go back to my example of trying to learn the height of UC Irvine students. If I start with a sample of 20 students out of 37,000, I'm gonna get a, an estimate. It's not gonna be that good. That's a pretty small sample. If I sample a thousand students, I expect it to get better. What does better mean? I expect it to be closer to the true mean. Why do I expect it to be closer? because I expect there to be less variability. To see this, think about the limit. Suppose I took a sample of 36,999 students from my population of 37,000. I'm gonna get the sample mean almost exactly right. And when I, every time I take a sample of that size, I'm gonna get almost exactly the same answer. And so the standard error is gonna go down as the sample gets bigger. And this formula here tells you how the standard error is equal to the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So let's see what that looks like in my IQ example. I got four pictures here. Let's just start with the top left picture. The top left picture is a histogram. What does it show? It says, suppose I'm giving IQ test and I have a population that I'm interested in. We can stay with my UC Irvine students, if you will. I'm no longer interested in their heights. I'm interested in their IQ scores. I take a random sample of 10. I give them the IQ test. I average their scores, and I write that number down. That average might come out to be 104. And then I get another sample of size 10. And I do give them a test, and I average their scores, and I write it down. And that average might be 101. And I do it a third time and a fourth time, and a fifth time, and I do it a thousand times. If you did it a thousand times, this is a picture that shows roughly what you would get. In fact, I did this using a computer to do exactly that. You can see that the average of the averages, right? 
every bar here shows you a set of results. Every, the average of the averages was 100. And they're not, remember the, sorry, remember this picture. Single IQ scores range from, you know, 60 to 140. Almost all of them are between 70 and 130. Whoops, where did it go? Here it is. The mean of 10 IQ scores, what happens to them? They don't go. You can't get a mean of 70. Why not? Because to get a mean of 70, 70 is rare in the population. To get a mean of 70, you'd have to find 10 people that have that rare value. So instead, we generally end up around 100. There is no bias. And the standard deviation or standard error, I'm sorry, that should say standard error. The standard error is 4.6. I showed you a formula on the previous slide that says the Standard error is the standard deviation IQ score is 15 divided by the square root of the sample size, which is 10, right? So the square root of 10, which is about three. And so the number should come out to be about five, a little less than five, and it does. And I told you that when you take bigger samples, things get more and more compact. So here's 25, the mean still around 100, but now the standard error is three. Things are much more compact. Here's 50 measurements. Take a sample of size 50. The mean is around 100, but now the standard error is around two. Things are even more compact. And now take 100 measurements and do that over and over and over again. The mean is again, extremely close to 100. And the standard deviation now or standard error is close to 1.5. Things are getting, I'm getting better and better conclusions by taking bigger and bigger samples. Okay. I think we've uh, belabored that. So, uh, so that's a little bit about estimation. And as I said, when we provide that point estimate, my estimate for the average IQ in this population is 100. We also want to provide a measure of our uncertainty. And that's called a confidence interval, usually. The confidence interval says, uh, here's my best estimate, but here's a range in which I'm confident the answer would lie if I got more data. And it turns out there's a really easy way to get a confidence interval. Um, we get a 95% confidence interval by taking our estimate plus or minus two standard errors. And we've already spent a lot of time today talking about the, uh, estimating a mean. That's the most common, one of the two most common in the ways in which this is done in the world, you say, I estimate the population mean by looking at my sample mean, and I give a confidence interval by taking my sample mean plus or minus two standard errors. The second popular way in which statistics is used, one is for the mean, is for a proportion. Last time we talked about a couple of political polls, tis the season, uh, election day is coming soon. Um, so you begin to see political polls virtually every day if you uh, care to look at them. So uh, the Georgia Senate election race, very, very close. The most recent polls that I saw had uh, Warnock uh, had 52% and uh, Walker had 48%. Those are, in fact, estimates of population. In this case, the population quantity that people are interested in is what is the proportion of likely voters that support candidate Warnock? To get that estimate, companies, newspapers, survey organizations take a survey. They grab a sample of the population of likely voters. They ask them who they're going to support. And they report that as, say, 52%. And when you get polls, they usually say it's 52%. And if the poll was about, uh, I'll say 400 people, um, it turns out that the um, margin of error is about 5%. So they would say it's 52% plus or minus 5%, which would be a way of saying, I think 52% of the population will support Warnock. But since this is just based on a sample, it would not surprise me if the true answer was between 47% and 57%. So that's another way in which this notion of interval estimation is used. Here's an example in forensics. If I want to take 10 
I find 10 glass fragments from a crime scene, and I measure the concentration of aluminum in each of those 10 fragments, I might find that those 10 glass fragment measurements average 0.73 and have a standard deviation of 0.04. And if I want to know what is the mean concentration of aluminum in the glass source that gave me these fragments, what I would do is I would say, well, the mean is my best estimate. How sure am I of that estimate? I should use the standard error to describe that uncertainty. That's the standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. And then I would create my confidence interval by saying the mean illumination, the mean aluminum in the crime scene glass source, the window, is the mean plus or minus two of these standard errors. It, my estimate for I'm confident that the mean in the for the window is between 0.704 and 0.756. That is, if I measured more and more fragments, I would get an answer that's going to be somewhere in this interval. Uh, interpretation of confidence intervals is very, very, uh, can be a little bit confusing. Um, it's easiest to just think about them as saying, I'm 95% sure that the right answer is in this interval. Uh, the, the, fine, the fine point about it is what we really know for sure is this is a statistical technique that's been developed um, using mathematical theory. That theory guarantees that 95% of the confidence intervals we create will contain the right answer. So that's kind of the true statement. What, what we just did on this slide is very close to that ASTM standard. It told you to measure the glass fragments. It told you to compute the mean. It told you to compute the standard deviation. It told you to take the mean plus or minus four standard deviations. So it's doing these statistical things. A few finer points about confidence intervals. Um, the width of the confidence interval depends on a few things. It depends on the amount of confidence we want. We almost always use 95%. That's become a default. But there are instances in which you may want to be more certain. And so you would ask for more confidence, and you would take more than two standard errors. You would take three standard errors. Um, it also depends on how good your estimate is, depends on how good your measurements are. So if you have IQ scores, which have a standard deviation of 15, that's a certain kind of IQ test. Someone might invent a better IQ test that has a smaller standard deviation, then you'll get more precise estimates. And we saw that the number of measurements matters. So uh, last bit of statistics, um, and I should have said, Anthony said, but I want to say two. Uh, please, please, if you have questions, um, jump in, ask them. Uh, I love questions. Uh, especially when we do this as a webinar. I see no faces. I see no signs of comprehension or lack thereof. So if you have a question, I, I would be willing to bet money that other people have the same question. Um, you, you're living in an uh, anonymous world. Um, so I don't know. No one else knows who's asking the question. Um, so it's for the greater good. If you're not understanding, please ask a question. I'll stop there. Uh, last topic about statistics is hypothesis testing. Um, sometimes we wish to formally test a hypothesis, it says. Um, for me, the best examples here, and there are forensic examples, believe me, we're going to spend the last hour talking about one. Uh, but the best example here is uh, the place where a lot of this grew up. The two places where statistical testing grew up are agriculture. That is, I have two different types of corn seed, which one yields better, uh, uh, which provides better corn yield, uh, you know, in terms of years of corn per acre or whatever, um, and medicine. So I'll use medicine today. Suppose we have a drug that we think will lower blood pressure, so we want to potentially give to people of high blood pressure. And then, uh, you know, drug company A invents a new drug that they think works better than what we've been using for the last 20 years. So they want to do an experiment to decide whether the new drug works better than the old one. We talked last time about how experiments are done, um, and we'll say a little bit more about it. But to remind you, what we would do is we would get a sample of patients from the population of high hypertensive people, people of high blood pressure. Hopefully, we could get a random sample of them to participate in our experiment. And then we would randomly assign half to the old drug 
and half to the new drug. And we would then wait a month and or six months or however long you need to wait. Um, and then measure the drop in blood pressure for the individual. And our, we'd like to see whether the new drug does better than the old drug or not. Hypothesis testing is the approach that's used for this type of question. Um, and the way that it's framed is there's a null hypothesis that we want to test. Somewhat paradoxically, the world is usually set up so that there's a null hypothesis we want to test that we don't actually believe is true. Um, and we hope to reject it. So in this case, we would set up the null hypothesis as being, and it's called null because it usually means something like no change. So in this case, the null hypothesis would be the new drug performs exactly the same as the old drug. And the alternative would be the new drug is better, right? The drug company developed it, did some experiment, did some testing in their lab, thinks it's gonna work better. The alternative is that it does better. And we'd like a procedure to help us make that decision. Uh, good, someone's asked a question about confidence intervals. I will come back to it. Um, so let's talk about testing first. So the way the tests work, uh, I have historically here, that's probably not the best words, some people still do this, um, is you would build a test procedure, a, a decision rule. Um, if the new drug leads to a five point or bigger drop than the old drug, I'm gonna decide that it works better and reject the null hypothesis. That's a decision rule. I didn't tell you where it came from, I just made it up. Okay. Um, and if you reject the hypothesis in this view of the world, we say it's statistically significant. When you do that test, there are two kinds of errors that you can make. Uh, these are commonly called type one errors or false positives and type two errors, in, which are false negatives. Uh, you may remember if you were here last week um, or the first week, um, you know, we talk about false positive and false negatives in the context of a pregnancy test or a gunshot residue test. Um, and in this case, false positive comes is the type one error is we reject the null hypothesis when in fact the null hypothesis is true. We have this new drug. We think it's going to be better. The null hypothesis is true means it's not actually better. It turns out it works exactly the same as the existing drug. But when I ran my test, just by chance perhaps, I declared that it did work better. That's usually a false positive because from the drug company's perspective, uh, having it work better is a positive outcome. In this case, they've concluded the positive outcome, but they were wrong. It, 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 it's not true. And a false negative is uh, when the New drug does work better, but you decide it doesn't. So you didn't reject the null. You decided the null hypothesis is probably true. The new drug's probably just about the same as the old drug. Um, you missed an opportunity there. So that's a false negative from the drug company's perspective. Typically, the type one error is considered more serious. Why? We don't want to send a drug out that's not better than the existing drug. It might even be worse than the existing drug. Um, so type one is usually considered more serious, but it can very much depend on the situation. Um, and one thing that we'll see is there's a trade-off between the two types of error, between type one and type two. So uh, if we make the test stricter, if I change my decision, will I say, I'm only gonna reject the null if the new drug is 10 points better or 15 points better or 20 points better. I'm making the test stricter means I'm not gonna have as many positives and therefore I'm not gonna have as many false positives. But if I do that, I risk more false negatives. I'm gonna miss some drugs that are really helpful. So that's how testing used to work. Uh, what we actually do now is slightly different. Um, very similar. We, uh, we do the test as I described it. We compute a test statistic. In this case, it would be the difference. It's usually the difference between the two drugs. Um, and you, know, you can kind of not worry too much about the details on the slide. And we divide it by the standard error just to get a constant form of measurement. But what we do is we say, if the test statistic came out big, one of two things has happened. Either 
the new drug works better than the old drug. That's kind of what I hope happened. Or they really work the same, but I got a big difference by chance. And the way that we decide that, and the last bullet here says, how do we decide? Uh, the answer is a quantity that's known as the p-value. So an alternative to setting up a decision rule at the front of the test is to carry out the test, look at the difference in the two drugs, and summarize by a p-value. A p-value is, I would say, without doubt, the single most confusing concept in statistics. Uh, the p-value gives the probability that you would see the data like the data you got if the null hypothesis were actually true. So I do my experiment. I see a difference. The new drug reduces blood pressure by 10 points more than the old drug. And I ask, and the p-value answers, how likely is it that you would see a 10-point difference in the averages if the null hypothesis were actually true? So a small p-value means I saw something unusual under the null hypothesis. If these two drugs work the same, if the p-value comes out to be 0.01, it would be saying, if these two drugs are really the same, the chance of getting a 10-point better difference for the new drug is 1 in 100. So I saw something unusual. There's only two explanations for that unusual thing. One is bad luck. They're really the same, and you just happen to see something unusual. The other is, if you will, good science, right? Um, the new drug actually works better. And so one thing to note is everything on this slide is assuming the null hypothesis is true. So the p-value, if you will, the shorthand is, if you don't worry about the technical details, the p-value is a measure of how close the experimental outcome is to what I would expect under the null hypothesis. How does this relate to forensic? For me, the best example is the glass comparison example. We have two samples we want to compare. We're going to assume the fragments on the suspect are a random sample from the population of glass on the sweater. We're going to assume that the random sample of fragments from the crime scene are a random sample from the population of the crime scene source. And we're going to ask the question, does the mean concentration of aluminum at the crime scene population equal the mean concentration for the population from the suspect? So that is how we take a forensic problem and turn it into this statistical hypothesis testing problem. Why do we frame it that way? we know that the sample means are not going to be the same. But we don't know whether they're close enough for us to think the populations could be the same. So here's how that works. This is kind of a wordy slide. I apologize. We set up a null hypothesis that the two means are the same. The null hypothesis is almost always a hypothesis of no difference. And an alternative hypothesis in this case is that they're not the same. And we get data, which I've labeled Y here, which are measurements from glass fragments at the crime scene, and data X, which are measurements from glass fragments found on the suspect. I compute the sample mean for each Y bar and X bar, and I compute the difference. And that's my test statistic. If these two populations have the same amount of aluminum, then I expect this difference to be near zero. If the difference is large, I'm willing to reject that hypothesis. Turns out this is a bread and butter statistics question. Any statistical software can do this. And so we do it all the time. And uh, one of the reasons the normal distribution is very popular is it works. Um, the procedure that you that would be exactly correct for normally distributed measurements turns out to be approximately correct for all kinds of measurements. So the normal distribution is useful to study because it gives us a procedure that works well all the time. So how does the test work? Um, you should focus only on the left. The left is an example of doing a test. What do I mean by that? What I've got here, the curve is 
what I would expect to happen if the null hypothesis is true, I'd expect to see a difference near zero. I might see a difference of one or negative one or two or negative two. But then I actually do the experiment. And the picture on the left, I saw 1.3. I'm just telling you that. That's this tall vertical bar. And here's negative 1.3. And this colored area, this uh, crosshatch area to the left and to the right are, those are the number of times I might get an answer 1.3 or bigger if the null hypothesis is true. I expect to get near zero, but it turns out about 20% of the time I could get an answer of 1.3 or bigger. That's what the picture on the left tells us. And the usual interpretation is, oh, 1.3 is unusual, but it's not crazy, crazy unusual. Something like that could happen 19% of the time. The picture on the right shows you a different test where the answer was 2.3. Notice that that is now very unusual. It's very unlikely that I would get such a difference. And so in this case on the right, I might draw a different conclusion and say, that difference is so large, I don't actually believe zero is the right answer. I believe that this drug works, the new drug works better or that the crime scene sample and the suspect sample are different. So that's how tests work. Brief summary, and I'll answer a couple of the question that came up and any other questions that come up, and we'll move on to forensics. Um, what we just went through, a statistical hypothesis test, it's funny because I'm talking to a bunch of forensic uh, examiners and students, people interested in the forensics world. Uh, when we teach statistics to undergraduates, we often use legal terms to help them understand the concepts. That is, we tell them that you can think about the null hypothesis as being a person is innocent because in our system, we assume the person is innocent until proven guilty. And in a hypothesis test, we, we assume the null hypothesis is true until proven not true. And the alternative is guilty. Then a type one error would be to decide someone is guilty when they're innocent. Uh, this is the point at which that example for me is not so helpful to students because we wouldn't say finding someone guilty is a positive unless you're a prosecutor. Um, uh, we, in, and unless they did it, right? So calling it a false positive in this case is you know, not necessarily the kind of language we want. So that's why type one and type two have evolved in uh, statistics. A uh, type two error would be to decide someone is innocent when they were guilty. Uh, when we apply this in forensics, you know, we'll change the language. We won't talk about false positives and false negatives. We'll talk about false exclusions and false inclusions. So um, we're going to spend a lot more time on the second hour on the, what, what it says here, which is that ASTM procedure that I use to motivate this statistics conversation basically introduces the use of statistical tests to decide whether two glass samples came from the same source or not. And I'm going to say, uh, we're going to spend a lot more time on this. So this slide tells you a little bit, but this is where we're headed. Um, the, what the way the ASTM standard works is it says, do the test, assume that all hypothesis is true. Um, if you can't reject an hypothesis, then the samples are indistinguishable. What the statistical test in my mind actually says is, based on these data, we can't distinguish the means, but it doesn't mean they came from the same source. So we're going to say a lot more about that later. They sound almost exactly the same. These things are indistinguishable. I could not distinguish them based on this sample. Sound exactly the same, but as we'll see, I'm going to argue that they're not exactly the same. A few technical points to wrap up. It uh, turns out Confidence intervals and tests are very close to each other. And uh, confidence interval says, based on the data, this is my best estimate for whatever I'm trying to estimate. Um, and it could be, uh, this is my best estimate for the difference in performance of these two drugs. This is my best estimate for the difference in aluminum concentration between these two glass sources. Right? The test flips the question. It says, don't tell me what your plausible values are for this parameter. Tell me whether you believe this one value or not. 
So statistical tests turn out to be very popular, um, but you happen to be sitting in a short course with someone who doesn't like them very much. Um, why don't I like them? Uh, confidence intervals to me are constructive. They are constructing a range of plausible values. They are conveying information about plausible values. Tests are destructive. They're saying this one value is not true. Confidence will says this set of values could be true. Test says this one value is not true. Which information would you rather have? I'd rather know what are the values that might be true. So um, again, more to come on that. Um, this is a good time to do the question. So I'm gonna call up a question from Lauren. Thank you, Lauren. Lauren says, when we do confidence intervals, we report drugs and weights, uh, we report drug weights or concentrations with 95% confidence interval. It, it says at times we are asked, what about the other 5%? Could it be zero? That is, could there be no drugs present? Uh, how do you recommend explaining it? Um, so uh, fantastic question, actually. Thank you for asking that. So the confidence interval is, and this is where for me, and I'm, I'm going to answer it for you, um, and then we'll have to work together to figure out how we might answer it for a jury, which is a different answer. So let's get the answer for you first, right? The answer for you is, based on the course we've had, right, there's some true concentration of you know, drugs in this whatever, right? Um, let's just say blood concentration of alcohol. I, I find that easier. There's some true blood concentration of alcohol in this blood sample, in this population, this person's blood. I've taken a sample. I'm trying to estimate that true population concentration. Uh, the sample concentration, my estimate is 0.09, uh, and my confidence interval ranges from 0.07 to 0 0.11, right? That's a 95% confidence interval. Right. If someone says to me, you know, could it be zero? I would say, well, no, right? I mean, I'm 95% sure it's between 0 0.07 and 0 0.11. If you want to be more sure, sure, I'll give you 99% confidence interval. And now it goes from 0 0.06 to 0 0.12. You want more? I'll give you 99.9% .9 confidence interval. It goes from 0 0.055 to 0 0.125, right? And so you can see that we're not getting to zero. And this is where a test comes in handy. You could actually test and say, I've measured 0.09. A statistical test tells me that the chance of getting 0.09 when the true value is zero is infinitesimal. And therefore, I'm you know, extremely confident it's not zero, right? So this, your question helps see why tests and confidence intervals are, have these different properties. Um, but the 95%, so, so that's kind of my first answer. One of the things about a statistician is uh, never having to be, uh, say you're certain. So there's always another answer. So that was my first answer. If you didn't like that one. Uh, second answer is, remember, what we do is we have a procedure that works 95% of the time. So the other 5% are instances in which the truth lies outside the interval. But based on our rules of probability, if it lies outside the interval, it most likely lies close to the ends of the interval. So there's not, it does not mean that there's a 5% chance that it's zero, right? It means that the rest of the values in the world have about a 5%. So um, I hope that helped. It's actually a hard question. Your question is a good one in part because uh, statistical concepts are hard to explain to jurors. <laughs> Oh, thanks, Lauren. Uh, Lauren said we tried increasing the confidence interval and the judge threw out the case. That's why I'm glad I'm a statistician and not a forensic practitioner. So uh, thanks. Um, so let's put that aside for now. We can come back if we want to talk more about it. <clears throat> Summary of hypothesis testing. Uh, hypothesis testing does not treat the two hypotheses symmetrically. <laughs> it assumes the null is true unless there is significant evidence against it. Uh, P-values turn out to depend very heavily on the sample size. This won't surprise you given our earlier conversation about confidence intervals. Confidence intervals get narrower in bigger sample sizes. We become more confident about the value and therefore P-values will end up getting smaller. And as I said, the tests are very tricky to interpret. Um, and Lauren's question showed confidence intervals tricky to interpret. I usually think they're easier than tests um, because when you do a test, 
um, when you reject an hypothesis, people are like, oh, this is great. Professors usually say, this is great. I can publish my paper. Um, you know, um, drug companies are great. They say this drug works better than the old drug. But that's not the interesting thing. As I said, the confidence is the interesting thing. If the new drug is better, how much better is it? Right. If the new drug costs 10 times more and it lowers your blood pressure by one point more, it's probably not worth it. Right. So just knowing that it's significant doesn't help. And the flip side is also very, very important. When you fail to reject the null hypothesis, it doesn't make the null hypothesis true. It means I couldn't reject it. And my favorite example of this is these political polls. People are co constantly saying, Warnock 52, Walker 48, margin error 5%. This race is a statistical dead heat. No, it's not a statistical dead heat. Warnock is ahead of Walker. He's ahead by a little. It's possible if I got a bigger sample, the result would flip. But based on the data I have, Warnock is ahead. And the confidence in all, the, so the test says that they're not significantly different, but Warnock's still ahead. So important things to know. So here's a couple of summary tests. I apologize. I like to usually do the Zoom test more integrated. We've kind of gone an hour before a Zoom test, but here are a couple of tests. Uh, so this is about confidence intervals, very closely related to uh, Lauren's question. So I want to estimate the amount of narcotics contained in a thousand confiscated bags. I take a random sample of 50 bags and I compute an interval for the mean weight uh, I get an estimate of how much of each bag is drug, and I use that to extrapolate to what's the mean weight of the population. It's not very well written, but for all that, for now, for the question, all you really need to know is I built a 95% confidence interval for the mean amount of drugs in this population by adding and subtracting two standard errors. And now I want to know what would happen to that confidence interval, how well you understand confidence interval, if I took a bigger sample, 100 bags instead of 50, if I used a, y, a 99, if I wanted 99% confidence interval, or in a different situation where there were actually 10,000 bags and I took a sample of 50. So the Zoom question asks you, for each of these situations, what would happen? So there's actually three questions. The first question says, if I took a sample of 100 bags instead of 50 bags, would the interval get wider, narrower, or it wouldn't make a difference? And the second question says, I built a 95% confidence interval. If I wanted to build a 99% confidence interval, would the interval get wider or narrower? Or you can't tell. And the third question says, if I was actually working with a population of 10,000 bags, and I still took a sample of 50, how would that affect my interval? Would it get wider, narrower, or you cannot determine? So those are three questions I uh, encourage you to answer. And here we go. So how does this work? If I take a sample of 100 bags instead of 50 bags, the majority think it gets narrower. I will note only 25 people answered, and there's about 42 people here, so that's not very good participation. Um, and if the 90, if I use a 99% interval, the majority thinks it would get wider. Um, and people are much less clear on what would happen if there's 10,000 confiscated bags. Thank you for participating, those that did. This is a repeat of the question on the top. And then the answers on the bottom. Uh, if you take a bigger sample, the standard error goes down. The confidence interval gets narrower. If you give a wider interval, as I described in answering Lauren's question, um, you get a wider confidence interval because plus or minus two standard errors gets you 95%. Plus or minus three standard errors gets you 99.7% plus or minus four standard errors gets you 99.99 something percent. So um, to get wider intervals, you need more standard. To get more confidence, you need wider intervals. The population size changing actually does not affect the answer. Um, this is an uh, important point that I should likely make earlier in the course. What's going on here? Um, it turns out if you can take a random sample, 
by definition, a random sample represents the entire population. It doesn't matter how big the population is. Uh, there's a limit to that, but that's reasonably true. And uh, the analogy for thinking about this would be tasting soup, right? So if you're making a uh, soup and you have a big pot of soup on your counter and a really big uh, mixing spoon too, um, if you, when you take a sip, you put your spoon in and take a sample, um, you know, if you really mix it well and you taste the sample to determine if it's too salty or not, it doesn't matter how big the pot is. Again, assuming I could mix it really well so that the scoop I took was representative, then it doesn't matter how big the, the, the sample, the population is, the sample is equally effective in giving me information. So that's a little counterintuitive. It seems like such a harder problem. I actually remember many years ago, 30 plus years ago, telling my parents as I tried to explain to them what statistics was about, that you know it didn't matter how big the population was, a sample of a thousand is really good. A sample of a thousand is representative of the city election in Irvine, which has a population of 300,000, the state election in California, which has a population of 40 million, or a national election, which has a population of 300 million. A sample of size a thousand provides the same degree of precision for any of those situations, as long as it's a randomly chosen sample. Okay, second question, hypothesis test. So I encourage you to read this paragraph. It says, um, I'm going to compare aluminum concentration and from crime scene glass versus aluminum concentration from suspect glass. I do a statistical test. The p-value turns out to be 0.23. Which of the following statements are true? Uh, I like to ask questions of this form. So there are four statements here. Uh, you're asked which are true. One may be true, two may be true, three may be true, four may be true. So uh, let's put that up and see what you think based on what you've heard today about a hypothesis test. Uh, the heavy majority, like number two, uh, again, more than one could be true, although I don't think more than one is true. Um, so two thirds of the people say the high p value means could have occurred by chance, um, but the other answers also um, got some support. So let's read them more carefully, closely together. Whoops, statistical question two. Um, so the p-value 0.23, um, this, let's start with the second one because that's really the best way to start here. It's what this, the second thing says, the high p-value means these data could have occurred by chance um, if the samples came from the same source. So do not reject the hypothesis. I view that as a true statement. Um, that's how I would interpret these data. Uh, reasonable people could disagree. Um, one of the things that is true is uh, we've, not all of you because you've been taking this class, but uh, people tend not to interpret probability all that well. And um, so 0.23 could happen relatively easily. Uh, if you flip a coin twice, you get heads tw twice two in a row. You know, that's not too unusual. We would not be surprised if that happened, right? So that's the benchmark I use. And so that's why I say true to number two. Number one says we would be likely to reject an hypothesis of equal means and declare the samples distinguishable. So uh, it says not true. Uh, that's not fair on my part. That is, uh, you might decide 0.23 is unusual enough that you would like to declare them distinguishable. Um, so it's a little hard to say it's not true. Um, but to my mind, you know, I would want to see a much smaller p-value before I drew that conclusion. Uh, the third bullet says these samples can't be distinguished based on these data. Uh, that's kind of true, actually. Um, the formal statistical statement is, I cannot reject the hypothesis that the population means are the same. The population means cannot be distinguished based on these samples, right? Uh, so I, I say it's kind of true. It's not true because the samples can be distinguished. One sample is higher mean than the other. But based on those samples, we can't necessarily assume it's population. Um, and the last says the samples came from the same window. I think only one person said that. Um, you know, one of the whole points of the statistics short course is to really begin to make our peace with uncertainty um, and say, even though I couldn't reject an hypothesis here, I still can't be certain they came from the same window. Uh, more on that to come. So thank you for participating in those. So this is summarizes the statistical inference piece. Um, statistical inference uses sample data to draw conclusions about a population. We covered point estimation, confidence intervals, and tests. The main point, of course, is that they deal with 
uncertainty and variation. And as we will soon see, intervals and tests play a role in the analysis of some evidence types. Um, and there's just a couple of caveats at the bottom of this slide about especially statistical hypothesis tests. So let's move and spend the last uh, 40 minutes on the stuff that hopefully more re relevant to, to practice, which is how do the ideas we just learned about statistics apply in forensics? Uh, this is a slide, the next three slides are actually slides I use in each session of the course. Um, they just re reset us so that we're thinking about things the same way. We have evidence E, which are items from a crime scene and a suspect or measurements of those items, typically. We have two hypotheses, which I'm going to start to, for this session and next session, refer to as the same source and different source uh, hypotheses uh, with different misspelled, I note. Um, so let me make a note of that. Okay. Um, and the goal is to look at the evidence and determine between these two. Uh, the way that this exam works, again, familiar to all of you, we look at the evidence, crime scene evidence, suspect evidence, try to assess whatever the similarities and differences we see um, in the glass example, it would really be how similar are the measurements, how different are the measurements. In pattern evidence like fingerprints, we would see some matching minutia. We would see some things that don't appear to match, maybe due to distortion. So we'd see some similarities and differences. We ask, am I likely to see that if they came from the same source? Am I likely to see that if they came from a different source? And use that to make a determination. Uh, and as I've been saying, um, my view for this course is we can think about three different ways of trying to summarize evidence. Last week, we talked about uh, summarizing the evidence as expert opinion based on experience, training, and accepted methods, and talked a lot about black box studies and their relevance. Today, we're going to talk about what is called the two-stage approach. Uh, stage one being determine whether evidence, is the two sort, the two evidence sources appear to have come from the same source um, and uh, the identification stage, which is saying uh, if they are indistinguishable, if they do seem to have come from the same source, how, uh, how could that be a coincidence? So that's what we're going to talk about today. And then next week, as I said, we're going to go back and talk about the likelihood ratio. So here's a little bit more detail. This is a method that was actually written up in a series of papers in the 1960s uh, in the context of forensics, which said to analyze evidence, we should think about two stages. The first stage, called the similarity stage, tries to determine if the crime scene and suspect, ob suspect objects agree on the characteristics we care about. And if they do, we would describe them as indistinguishable. We cannot distinguish them. We sometimes use the term match, although that's not a particularly popular one. And then the Parker and Holford papers said, Stage two would then be the identification stage, which would be to, uh, assuming we've determined things are indistinguishable, assess the significance of this statement by finding the likelihood of a chance agreement. So that's sometimes called the comparison significance approach. Um, it is used in the assessment of trace evidence glass. Um, in my time on the OSAC, I was on the physics pattern OSAC, I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago, um, as I talked to many, many different, both forensic examiners and statisticians who work with forensic examiners, you know, I remember a friend of mine saying, you know, it, glass is, is clear how you think about it in glass, but in truth, a lot of forensic examinations work this way. The examiner, even with pattern evidence, looks at the evidence, looks at the similarities, looks at the difference, tries to make that determination, you know, as it was explained to me, starts by saying, I'm going to assume they're different, and I'm looking for differences, and I'm looking for differences, and I'm not finding differences, and I'm seeing similarities, and I'm seeing more similarities. And at some point, I tip over and I say, you know, I can't distinguish between these two. And so that's like stage one done. And then stage two is to say, um, you know, these look the same, you know, but it's not that unusual to see that level of similarity in a flip-flop, for example, or whatever, right? So um, 
So that, but that's the two stages, um, those two stages. So let's talk about those in sequence. First, we'll talk about stage one, and then we'll talk about stage two. So stage one is trying to determine if the evidence, quote unquote, agrees. Um, so that's easy for some types of evidence. Um, it's easy to say that if the suspect has blood type A and blood type A was found at the crime scene, that the evidence agrees. Same for DNA alleles. Uh, but when you have continuous measurements like glass, and the aluminum you measure from the crime scene sample was one or was 0 0.1, 0 0.71, and the aluminum you measured from the suspect was 0 0.712, is that distinguishable or not? So that turns out statistical significance tests, which golly gee, we just spent 15 minutes learning, uh, can be used for stage one in a two-stage approach. Uh, important point for me, and hopefully I will convince you, is uh, choosing to do stage one in a binary yes-no way has a loss of information associated with it. Uh, when I say I can't distinguish between these two samples, it, I, maybe I can't distinguish because they provide almost exactly the same measurement, or it may be that they can't be distinguished because uh, they provide different measurements, but they provide measurements that are different uh, in a way that could have happened by chance. Right? Those are different settings. And to now say, oh, they both, quote unquote, pass stage one, they're indistinguishable, and treat that, them the same, I personally find troubling. Um, we don't have to spend a lot of time on this slide because it's a, an exact rewrite of a slide from 10 slides ago, or probably 15 slides ago. How might I do stage one for glass? I would characterize the two glass samples, the two glass populations, crime scene versus suspect, as by their mean. And I would obtain samples from each population. I would get those sample means. I would do a test, it's called a t-test, to determine whether those means are significantly different or not. I would summarize it by the p-value. And if the p-value is small, I would say I could distinguish. If the p-value is not small, I would say I can't distinguish between the samples. Right? So we know that. Here's an example. These data come from a paper uh, by a statistician in New Zealand and some co-authors um, in which um, I had to go back and look at this as I was preparing for the class. Um, they were using a more sophisticated approach than I'm about to describe, but I borrowed their data. No, this is not their approach, this is their data. Um, I, they, I give you five measurements of aluminum concentration from a crime scene sample, um, and five measurements of aluminum concentration from a recovered sample. They look pretty similar just by the eyeball test. The statistical test yields a p-value of 0.7. The difference in the means is small. The standard error is big. Um, the p-value is big. There's no reason to reject the hypothesis of equal means. Following the ASTM standard, we would say these two samples are indistinguishable. And in this case, I know the truth because Curran collected the data. These are 10 measurements from the same glass bottle. Just to show you what the world might look like in the other case, these are two other samples in the current paper. These are five measurements of magnesium concentration from a crime scene sample and five measurements of magnesium concentration from a suspect sample. And you can tell right away, these five look very different. The top five much bigger than the bottom five. And the means are different. The standard errors are kind of similar, but different, but similar. Um, but when I do the t-statistic, I get a huge number. T-statistics of about two are on the border of being significant. So 12 is very, very big difference. And the p-value you can see is very, 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 very small which says, I could not get a difference like this by chance if they came from the same bottle. And it is in fact true that they came from different bottles. In fact, one was a brown bottle and one is a colorless bottle in this case. So that's how the test works. It can work, good to know. Uh, I sometimes do give this presentation to statisticians. This is more for them. Uh, there are a lot of different statistical tests that you can use procedures. Um, I showed you the t-test. Uh, there's a procedure that's known as Hotelling's T-squared test. Uh, that's actually what the current article is about. They were demonstrating this. So technical details, not important for today. These are 
technical concerns that people raise about the procedures. But again, not important for me. These are things statisticians would worry about. Um, they are worth worrying about statistically. But for me, the most important concerns about this approach are conceptual. Um, it's not a crazy thing to do, the two-stage approach, but there are some things you should know and that we should know about it. And so let's go through some of these quote unquote conceptual concerns. So I think there are three concerns I wanna raise. The first concern is about the role of the null hypothesis. I remind you that hypothesis tests, significance tests do not treat the two hypotheses symmetrically. The null hypothesis is assumed true. In this case, the null hypothesis is equal mean. So just note, we're assuming at the start that populations are indistinguishable unless I can prove otherwise. So now a type one error here is a false exclusion. That is, the null hypothesis is true. The glass samples are indistinguishable, but I rejected it means I falsely excluded the person. A type two error is a false inclusion. That is, the null hypothesis was wrong. The glass should have been distinguishable. I could not distinguish based on the samples I collected. So I included this person as being a plausible suspect. So it's a false inclusion. And so the type one, stage one concern for me is we actually have the wrong starting point, right? If we want to assume people are innocent until proven guilty, we should start by assuming the samples are distinguishable and seeing whether there's enough evidence to reject that. And the statistical procedure does not. It starts by assuming they are indistinguishable. So that's one concern. Second concern, is uh, going back to something I mentioned at the start of this discussion. Um, I find the binary decision aspect of stage one problematic. Why? A binary decision requires that you choose a threshold or a cutoff. You have to decide when you're going to th declare things distinguishable. You might decide a 0.05 p-value is your cutoff. If the p-value is below 0.05, uh, if the observations you got would only happen less than one out of 20 times, you might decide, gee, that's unusual. I'm gonna declare them distinguishable in that case. But someone else might use a different threshold. Well, it turns out if you choose a low threshold, a low bar, uh, it's a little confusing because in this case, uh, a low threshold actually corresponds to a high p-value. But if you make it easy to reject, it means you're gonna make more false exclusion errors. If you put in place a strict threshold, a high bar, which in this case means a low p-value, if you use a high threshold, you're making it difficult to reject. So you're gonna to continue to believe that null hypothesis and you're gonna have more false exclusions. I'm gonna show you some pictures because I think this is a really, really important point. Um, uh, Another uh, you know, slightly less important point, still important, is the last bullet on this slide. Um, there's a little bit of a paradox here, which is worth noting, which is um, suppose I have two methods for measuring chemical concentrations. One is laser ablation, blah, 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 right? And the other is you know, uh, super duper microscope. So I have two different ways of measuring chemical concentration. One works better in the sense of having a smaller standard deviation. Paradoxically, using the worse instrument makes it harder to distinguish the glass samples and easier to continue to believe the null hypothesis. <clears throat> so somehow, if we want to find the indistinguishable, we want to have more suspects included, it would push us to use worse technology which is a little odd, but that's a less important to me than the threshold question. So let me show you something about that threshold question. This should look a little familiar. We showed a picture of this when I was telling you how tests work. But um, so let me, let's look at the left picture here. The left picture is basically showing how stage one might work. Um, 
I have two glass samples. And what I'm showing you here is the difference in the aluminum concentration for those samples. Um, if the null hypothesis is true, the glass samples are indistinguishable. I expect that difference to be about zero. And here I put in a threshold of 0.05. If the difference I see is bigger than 0.05 in, you know, uh, in parts per million, then I'm going to exclude. And so in this picture, these, this black area are false exclusions, right? The difference should be zero. We know in this case, the glass is indistinguishable. By chance, I might have seen a big difference, six parts per million, seven parts per million, eight parts per million. Those are false exclusions. The bottom picture on the left says, suppose it's not true. And in fact, glass source one has more aluminum than glass source two. Then I should get a difference up here around 0.07. And I do most of the time get things bigger than 0.05 that cause me to declare things indistinguishable. But sometimes by chance, I end up in this red area where one source has more aluminum than the other, but the samples I collect from the two sources are closer to zero. And I include the person, the samples as being indistinguishable and the suspect is incriminated. So these are false inclusions. These are false exclusions. Let's lower the threshold. Let's make it easier to exclude. So I moved it in from five parts per million to four parts per million. What happened? The black area got bigger. The red area got smaller. I made fault more false exclusions, but it came at a price. I, I'm sorry, I have fewer false inclusions, right? You could argue this is a good change. I am not incriminating people as often incorrectly, but it comes at a price. I'm giving up more people that should have been incriminated. I'm excluding them. It seems like we'd want to find a threshold that makes both of these errors small. But what this picture shows is for a given amount of data, you can't do that. You have to draw a line. And if you move the line, you create one of more kind of one of more type of error and less of the other. It's unavoidable. If you get more data, you can do a little better on both. But then for that data too, you must draw a threshold and drawing that threshold will trade off these two errors. So stage one, has this problem of favoring the null hypothesis. Second problem is drawing a threshold involves trading off two kinds of errors, and it's not so obvious how to do that. My final concern actually applies to both stages, but I'm calling it a stage one concern. When you separate the match and the non-match decision from the assessment, you it's clearly, not, and to me, not the best way to proceed. And this same conversation is not just about forensics. It is happening all over statistics. We won't spend time on it today. Uh, there's a conversation in science about the so-called replication crisis or uh, lack of replication crisis. That is, people publish studies that say uh, this drug works better than this drug or uh, you know, these kinds of people are more sympathetic than these kinds of people. And then the next group does the study and finds the exact opposite. And a lot of the blame for that is going on this separation of stage one, trying to draw a conclusion, yes, no, uh, and then stage two, you know, and, and that's problematic. So the major US Statistical Association just recently recommended within the last few years that we should try to move away from the term statistically significant um, and instead do a better job of reporting either confidence intervals or recording uh, reporting p-values and letting people understand exactly where the evidence is, not putting a binary decision in place. So uh, I'm not going to go into detail about solutions, but I want you to know there are solutions. And one of the things that uh, should, ha should happen in my mind is, is as statisticians get more involved in forensics, we can try to think about other procedures that deal with some of these concerns. So uh, here, the first thing I lay out is, remember we said uh, relying on the null hypothesis is problematic because the null hypothesis is incriminating. And you could argue, and a friend of mine who does forensics you know, said, you know, gosh, this all seems backwards to me. We should start off by assuming there's a difference and then see if we can reject that. It turns out you can do that. And 
the null, you can flip it. So the null hypothesis is there is a difference, but to do it, you have to add some practically important threshold delta, your Greek letter delta. Um, and so the null hypothesis becomes, I think the difference is bigger than delta. So I think I can discriminate. And then I'm good, if I reject that, I'm deciding that they're indistinguishable. And that seems to be the right way to frame the question. Um, gets a little more technical to do that, but it, it can be done. Um, and again, it, these things are not unique to forensics. Forensics is just not that unique. That is, this question comes up in drugs. How, uh, everyone on the course has presumably heard about generic drugs. When you, when you build a generic drug, what are you trying to do? You're not trying to build a drug that's better than the existing drug. You're trying to build a drug that's equivalent to the existing drug. And so when people test generic drugs, they do this test on this slide. They start by assuming the generic is not equivalent to the current drug. And if they can, it is only if they can reject that and prove that it's indistinguishable from the current drug that they're allowed to go to market. Uh, the other concerns I raised about binary decisions and the separation between match and significance um, are some of the reasons that people like the likelihood ratio. So I'm not going to say more about them today. Um, we will see them next week, but at that time next week, I will come back. I will refer back to this point in this presentation to say, remember some of the things we were concerned about in the two stage. Uh, so the last little bit of the, today's presentation is to think a little bit about stage two. So now let's assume for the moment that we did do a two stage. Stage one, we did conclude that they were indistinguishable. And so, you know, the suspect is at the moment incriminated by that information. And stage two says, well, that's important to know, but we should figure out if this is really truly incriminating or not, or if it uh, could be a coincidence. So I would give a couple of examples here, you know, uh, that are more eyewitness type examples. So suppose, you know, we have uh, a crime scene in which a pink car was observed and then a suspect is found driving away uh, in a pink car. Right? Um, and one of the things we would say is, you know, step one, does the suspect's car match the crime scene car? Yes, they're both pink. So that's, they're indistinguishable in color. What's the significance of that? Well, pink cars are pretty rare. That becomes pretty significant. If they agreed on a white car, we would say that's much less significant, right? Um, the other example that I always, uh, I like to think about in this context is uh, from the movie, The Fugitive. Uh, if you have not seen the movie, The Fugitive, you should, it's a great movie. Uh, but The Fugitive, um, it was uh, wrongfully convicted of murdering his wife. And the fugitive uh, was a doctor, made the claim that uh, he did not kill his wife, that in fact, someone else broke into their house, killed his wife and knocked him out. Um, and this person, he said, was a one-armed man. And so, uh, it, you know, towards the end of the movie, when they find the suspect, um, the fact that it is, they found a one-armed man implicated in this complicated story um, is obviously very compelling evidence, right? Uh, you wouldn't have a very interesting movie if the doctor said, no, it was a two-armed man, um, and then they found a two-armed man, right? There's lots of two-armed men. So, um, so we need to know how unusual or rare the match is. Um, so stage two, um, you know, one of the things that sets off a lot of statisticians is that ASTM standard really ends at the point at which it says, and if this happens, you have found that the samples are cannot be distinguished. For me, that's not a good ending, right? Um, we should try to provide, you know, as a forensic exam, we should provide more information. We could not distinguish these two glass samples and dot, 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 dot. So what does the and dot, 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 dot look like in this case? Well, it's easy to do for things like the color of the crime scene uh, of the car. Um, it's also easy to do for discrete data like blood type. So here's how, how it would go for blood type, right? We found material from the crime scene that was blood type A, and we found a suspect, and the suspect has blood type A. Well, then we would say, boy, 
the suspect matches, right? They can't be distinguished based on blood type. But in this case, we would say stage two, how common is it to find a type A person out there? 42% of the US population is blood type A. This is not very compelling evidence. If the same thing happened with type AB, you only 4% of the US is type AB. So that is more probative, more informative. Um, um, but of course, to do this, you need some information about the population. So I know that for blood type, but I may not know it for shoe size or for number of pink cars, et cetera. So how might it work for continuous data? So here's a picture of a data set that's out there in the public domain. This is uh, on the order of 2,200 different glass sources. And for each glass source, a number of fragments were analyzed. And the figure here shows the mean refraction index for different windows. And you can see most of them are between 1.515 and 1.520. Um, and suppose we were doing a case, there was a sample from the crime scene that was 1.522. And we found a suspect that also had a, measurements that were around the same. We would say that sounds indistinguishable. So the suspect could have been at the source of the crime, but we might want to ask, what's the probability that another source could have led to similar measurements? Well, we can use this picture to think about how that might work. If you can see my cursor here, right? If I, there's some samples down here. If I got a source from down here, be very unlikely to get a sample of fragments that match the red line. If it was over here, it's probably still unlikely, but possible. If it's over here, it's quite likely that these sources would match. And so we would want to use some information about the population, ignoring for the moment how hard that may be to get, to see whether we could get a coincidental match. So I've done this. Um, here's an example. Uh, it goes back to some data I showed at the very start of today. Uh, suppose we were looking at aluminum concentration. The mean was 0.73. Um, the standard deviation was 0.04, and it was based on five measurements. And, uh, and the way that I could do this was to say, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get a sample from the sus suspect, if you will. I'm going to get five fragments from the suspect. I'm going to compute the aluminum concentration. I'm going to do my t-test. And if the p-value is less than 0.05, I'm going to reject. So that's how I'm going to make my stage one determination. And if I know that, I can actually do stage two uh, by knowing something about the population. To make the population simple story simple, I'm going to suppose the world in which we live, you know, the city of Irvine, only has three types of glass. Some types of glass in Irvine have aluminum concentration equal to 0.73. Some have concentrations equal to 0.78. And some have concentration 0.83. Those are the only three types of glass you can find in Irvine. It's a planned community. It really is. And so only three types of glass were used when it was built up. And those are the three measurements. So that's, instead of this distribution, which is a little messy, I've created a distribution where there's only three uh, possible types of glass. And for those three types of glass, I can actually do the calculation and, and tell you that, you know, the glass sources that truly have mean 0.73 are going to give me answers similar to 0.73. So I'm not going to be, they're going to be found indistinguishable most of the time. 0.78 is different. It's higher. I expect most samples will be higher, but some may end up being very similar to 0.73. It turns out in this case that I will be able to distinguish 51% of the time, 49% of the time, they'll still be indistinguishable. And some random sources have means 0.83, and these will be relatively easy to distinguish. So it's very unlikely that I'll declare indistinguishable. And so if I know in Irvine how many of each of these happen, I can do the stage two. And I can say, I got matching samples, but that should only happen 10% of the time. And the jury could use that information. So the stage two is hard to do, but conceptually, I've tried to tell you how I would do it. 
Um, if you explore this glass situation, what you find is when is glass evidence valuable? It's valuable when the sample from the crime scene and the suspect sample is, uh, sorry, when the control sample, sorry, I didn't necessarily frame that right. When is the probability of a coincidental match high? So the evidence is weak. The evidence is gonna be weak when you have a very typical piece of glass. And the evidence is also gonna be weak when we know there are lots and lots of different kinds of glass and lots of lots of different kinds of measurements. And so what makes strong evidence is when you have, I don't know if I say this or not, I should, I don't. What, what makes strong evidence is if you have two sets of fragments that agree on an unusual value, right? So if they agree on a common value, that's weaker evidence. Okay, that's how stage two should work. A couple of, we're near the end, a couple of questions, and then uh, hopefully quite more questions from you. But first, two questions from me about the two-stage approach. The first stage uh, says, um, at the first stage, we have to choose a cutoff. And so I have two questions. Uh, I have whew, a bunch of statements about how we might choose the cutoff for deciding whether two samples are indistinguishable. And I ask you which are, are attractive to you, which are true. And so read the five statements. You can choose as many as you like, uh, which are true. Uh-oh, fewer people participating is not a good sign. Um, People are still logged in. That's a good sign, but they're not participating. That's a bad sign. Uh, so if you're not participating, ask me a question. Why aren't you participating? Um, so we see that uh, the fifth answer everyone likes, and the second and third answer some people like. So let's go back over those a little bit more. Um, the, the first one says a high cutoff is the best way to go because it will make it difficult to eliminate a suspect. And I say this is not a helpful statement because it doesn't tell you how high or, or, and the next one doesn't tell you how low. The second one says a low cutoff is best because it gives the benefit of the doubt to the suspect. It makes it easier to let a suspect go. Uh, more people found that attractive, consistent with our view of justice in the United States. So that's a good thing. Um, the third says we should choose a cutoff so there are no type one and type two errors. A lot of people like that idea. I like that idea too. Uh, um, it turns out that that's generally speaking impossible. It shouldn't really say this is impossible. It should say it's generally impossible um, unless we're willing to collect a lot of data. Um, so the fourth answer um, is uh, says the statistician should get to choose the cutoff. Um, and that's uh, not a good idea. Uh, so I actually, as most of you, like the last answer the best. Figuring out where to put the cutoff is a hard problem. Uh, and last test yourself question for the day, which of the following statements about stage two would you support? Stage two is very important because we need to know how unusual it is to find indistinguishable samples. It's not very important because once you've got matching samples, that's all you need to know. Uh, stage two is difficult because the relevant population will vary from case to case. Stage two is not necessary. We just tell them it's indistinguishable and the jury can decide. Or I'm getting tired of this type of question. Once again, you could choose more than one answer. And uh, one and three are very popular answers, and they are correct. Those are the answers that I like. Uh, doesn't make them correct, but it does in this case. Um, so it is, you know, stage two is very important, um, and um, it is very difficult as well. And so, uh, you know, one of the reasons that I think um, so here's my summary for the today's session. Uh, we spent the first hour, actually hour and 20 minutes or so, learning some of the basic statistical tools about how we draw conclusions about populations. Um, and I hope that the second half made you understand why that's a valuable perspective to have. The population sample um, understanding about uncertainty and what could happen by chance. Um, it, it feeds into this notion of a two-stage process where I say, do these two samples indicate different populations or the same population, different sources or the same source? Um, and some of the challenges in doing those tests um, and also
uh, the importance of the second stage in this analysis. Um, and um, so we have a few minutes, only a few, um, but if people have questions, I'd love to hear them. Um, if not, uh, we'll, I'll make a few comments while we wait to see if, whoops, if questions come up. Um, you will get, uh, Anthony's going to say this, but I want to emphasize, we take input very serious. If there are things that did not work today, I would like to know, uh, as those who have been coming know. Um, this course was reworked from three sessions to four, and it was actually a considerable amount of work that I'm happy to do, in part because people felt stuff was jammed, and I felt like a, a single two-hour session on statistics was not super helpful to people, that each piece of the statistical puzzle should go with a piece of the forensics puzzle. So your feedback, extremely, extremely valuable. Um, and uh, with that said, and it being 957 Pacific, um, I'll stop here um, and uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I encourage you to invite your friends. Next week is a likelihood ratio discussion. It, it, all of the sessions follow, but they are also intended to be self-contained. Uh, you will have an advantage over any friends you bring uh, because you know probability, but um, you should invite friends. They are welcome to join the meeting. Uh, we do have a question. Thank you. Great job again. I like hearing that. But um, so uh, please invite others if you like, if you've been talking about likelihood ratio in your lab. And Anthony, I will stop and let you do whatever that voodoo that you do so well to close us off. Thank you all for joining us. We hope you have a great day.